Most gracious Heavenly Father, we praise you that you alone are holy, Lord, and you are eternal. You're from everlasting to everlasting, and you are sovereign over every detail of our lives. And Father, I um, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truths that we're learning through Matthew, and I I pray, Father, that you would go before us this mor- this evening, that you would open our minds and our hearts to receive your word. I pray that you would send your Holy Spirit to teach us. I just thank you for this church and their graciousness to open up the doors to us each week. And Father, I just um, I just pray that we would learn what you would want us to learn this evening about discipleship, that um, true discipleship means following your son, Jesus Christ, at any cost. So Father, I pray that you would just teach us the details that you want us to see in the passage this evening. And you and you alone would be glorified. So it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So how do you introduce a person to Jesus Christ? Have you ever had the opportunity to share the gospel to introduce someone to Jesus? So who is Jesus to you? We all have to come to a point in our lives where we have the opportunity to answer this question, the same question. But we all have different answers. Who is Jesus to you? So these are powerful words, and we see that in our passage this evening. And they are life-changing words that demand a response. In our notes um, over Matthew chapter 16, um, it describes our response as a life-defining moment when we're able to answer that question. So for me, I responded to these words when I was 11 years old at an altar call on a Sunday evening that seemed to be like any other evening at church on on a Sunday evening. But this was when Jesus um, called me to answer this question. And that was the evening that he became Lord and Savior of my life. But over the years of walking with him and studying his word... He has become so much more. He has become my best friend. And as I walk with him daily and I'm in a relationship with him, he becomes sweeter and sweeter to me each day. So he requires total surrender of my heart, of your heart. And he promises to never leave us or forsake us. So maybe you're here this evening and you don't have the answer to this question about who Jesus is. And maybe you are wrestling with this question. Maybe Jesus is still revealing to you who he is. So as we open up his word this evening in Matthew chapter 16, may God reveal to you personally who Jesus is to you. And we'll see how Jesus changed the thinking of the disciples as he grew their faith and he continued to prepare them for their future, their future role of sharing the gospel, to be disciples in his kingdom when he, after he was gone. And he showed them how he was going to build his church. So we'll look at how Jesus changed their perspective of sharing in his suffering to a blessing rather than a burden. So he made them understand that true discipleship means following Jesus at any cost. So we're going to be looking at two divisions this evening. The first one is faith, and that is in Matthew chapter 16 in verses 1 through 20. And the second division is focus, and that is in verses 21 through 28. So if you haven't already, open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 16. So remember last week we left off in Matthew 15 where we saw... That Jesus performed many miracles. He healed many people who were sick. And we saw that he ended his ministry in the Gentile region by feeding 4,000 plus people. And he dismissed the crowd. And he got into the boat with his disciples. And they went into the Jewish territory of the region of Magadan. And... Where we see that Jesus was met again by the unbelieving Pharisees and the Sadducees who were opposing his teaching with the intention of interrupting him. So look with me to verse 1. It says, The Pharisees and the Sadducees came to Jesus and tested him. 
by asking him to show them a sign from heaven. So these two religious groups came together to meet Jesus, and Matthew tells us with the purpose of testing Jesus. And these men had a long-standing rivalry, so the fact that they were working together to discredit Jesus shows that they regarded him as a serious threat. So we see that the leaders, they asked for a sign coming from heaven and intentionally ignored the miracles that Jesus had already done. And Jesus had done many signs and miracles, and yet they remained unconvinced that Jesus was who he said he was. So they intentionally told him, you know your miracles here on earth don't prove your claim as the Son of God. Show us something from heaven. And they believe that the sign in um, they believe that a sign done on earth could be counterfeit. That's what tradition, their traditional beliefs taught. But signs done from heaven or coming from the sky were assumed to be from God. So here they were asking Jesus to perform a heavenly miracle, thinking it would be impossible for him to do. But look how Jesus responds, beginning in verse 2. He said, When evening comes, you say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red, and in the morning, today it will be stormy, for the sky is red and overcast. You know how to enter in interpret the appearance of the sky, but you cannot interpret the sign of the times. So Jesus responds, we see here with facts, with he doesn't um, respond to them emotionally because he knew the condition of their hearts. And he points out to the leaders that they are confident in predicting the weather with the signs they saw around them. But they chose to be blind to the evidence proving that he was the Messiah, who he said he was. So here he was, the long-awaited Messiah, but they refused to even acknowledge him. So then we see that Jesus says in verse 4, A wicked and adulterous generation looks for a sign, but none will be given it except the sign of Jonah. So Jesus referred to the story of Jonah to prove his point. And being experts in the Old Testament teaching, these religious leaders were familiar with the account of of Jonah. But they failed to recognize that Jonah's story, it pointed to Jesus. And remember, Jesus had already been asked for a sign in uh, Matthew chapter 12. And he repeats his reply. But none will be given a sign except the sign of Jonah. So Jesus was saying, Jonah is the sign, and he is pointing to me. So both Jesus and Jonah came back to life after three days. So Jesus was talking about his death, his burial, and his resurrection. But these religious leaders did not make the connection. Their blind faith is what made them overlook the promised Savior they preached about. But Jesus wants us to see that unbelief is a serious matter. Refusal to believe in Jesus eventually leads to an inability to see him fully for who he is. So after exposing their hypocrisy of these uh, religious leaders, Jesus then left them and he went away, it says. So after this, Jesus, he addresses the disciples regarding their confused faith. So look with me beginning in verse 5. It says, When they went across the lake, the disciples forgot to take bread. Be careful, Jesus said to them. Be on your guard against the yeast of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. So the disciples, they were confused and thought Jesus was talking about actual bread when he was referring to the corruption of the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Because remember, many times in the Bible, yeast is is referred to as being evil. 
So Jesus told the disciples in verse um, 8, it says, You of little faith, why are you talking among yourselves about having no bread? Do you still not understand? So we asked them. So Jesus was always concerned about his disciples' spiritual growth, just like he is about our spiritual growth. So he reminded he was fully capable, and they had seen that he performed miracles, that he could provide bread in situations where there was nothing to eat. But he... um, was exposing their for, their forgetfulness and their unbelief. And it was then that the disciples, they realized that he was warning them about the wrong teaching of the religious leaders. So does this sound familiar? How similar are we to these disciples? How often do we become preoccupied with the world, with things that are going on around us. And Jesus is the one who is constantly using our daily lives to minister to us and to show us his faithfulness to his people. And he knows how quickly we forget about things. We forget about the miracles that he does in our lives. We forget that he's faithful in the past and he'll be faithful in the future. And he knows how distracted we become by the world that constantly tries to grab our attention. But Jesus knows our thoughts, and he knows our hearts, and he knows when we become easily distracted. So he uses his word to draw us back, to give us focus, to give us clarity about who he is. So in what ways... Does preoccupation with daily life dull your spiritual perception? Then we see that Jesus and his disciples, they crossed the Sea of Galilee to Caesarea Philippi off the Mediterranean coast. It was a beautiful area, which was um, a Gentile area, territory. So look with me beginning in verse 13 to the first question that Jesus asked his disciples. Who do you say the Son of Man is? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So we see that the disciples, they answered based on popular opinion. You see they said some say. But all these trendy answers, they underestimated Jesus for who he really is. And then we see the second question, which would change the course of their lives forever. So in verse 15, Jesus asked, but what about you? Who do you say I am? So Jesus had asked them what they believed about him. And at Jesus' most, they were his most trusted inner circle, these men, these disciples. And their answers would have been shaped by the truths that Jesus had been teaching them. He was their master. So can you even imagine their thoughts as Jesus asked the question, who do you say I am? So Peter, who was often the spokesman, Of the group, he answered in verse 16, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. So Peter, he openly declared that Jesus, the man that they knew and that they loved, was also the Messiah, the rescuer, the promised one, all throughout the Old Testament. So Peter's response to the question is one of the most important answers in the whole Bible. So Peter's confession recognized Jesus as the Messiah, the son of the living God who had come to save people, his people from their sin. And Jesus was more popular. He was more, excuse me, he was more than just a prophet. He was the center of God's promise and plan. So the popular answer that they first gave was not who he was. 
So Peter's profession of faith captured the eternal truth of Jesus' deity, which rejected the unbelief of the religious leaders. And this proved clarity to the confused disciples. Then in verse 17, Jesus responded to Peter's confession with powerful words of encouragement. So blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. So Jesus first revealed to Peter that he spoke of divine inspiration. It says, my father in heaven. So even though Peter was unaware at the time, God spoke through Peter so naturally that he didn't even realize it was his father in in heaven who had given this revelation to him. And he also opened Peter's heart to the deeper knowledge of of Christ by faith. And that's what he does for us today. He opens our heart to receive Jesus. And he he's the one, God is the one who enabled Peter to make this bold declaration. So look back in verse 16. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Peter was not just stating facts about the identity of Jesus But he was confessing um, his faith in Jesus that made it possible for him to have this divinely regenerated heart. So Peter's confession, it set the course of the future for God's people. Because look at what Jesus says in verse 18. And I tell you... That you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. The gate of Hades will not overcome it. So this is the first mention of the church in the whole Bible. So the church is formed by individuals whom God has selected to be his children and to be saved in him. So ever since Peter's powerful declaration of who Jesus is, people across time and nations have confessed their faith in Jesus as the promised Messiah. So these individuals from the church are the body of Christ, of which Jesus is the head of the church. And the church includes um, a body of believers in the local community, as well as the worldwide church of believers for all time. So the church belongs to Christ. He is the one who builds his church and his church continues to grow by the work of the Holy Spirit among people. And the church cannot be overcome and will prevail by God's power. So then Jesus goes on in verse 19, I will give you the keys of the kingdom. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. So binding and loosing were terms in the daily life of the Jewish people. They would have been familiar with these terms. They were um, used in context of the law given to Moses. So sinners who hear the gospel and believe are set free. They're loosed from sin. But sinners who hear the gospel but refuse to believe remain bound in sin. So the keys are symbolic of Jesus' command to the disciples to unlock the power of the good news of the gospel to the world, which sets the foundation for the church. So the gospel is what opens the kingdom of heaven to all who believe. So Jesus, he was pleased that his disciples were coming to know what he was saying, the truths that he was teaching, but he didn't want his identity known to those outside of his inner circle before the time had come. Because look what he says in verse 20. It says that Jesus warned his disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Christ. So in our passage, we see 
the progression of Jesus' disciples growing in their understanding as they walk with him, as they listen to him, as he teaches them. And it's through that relationship that they can boldly confess who he is. And for us today, our journey with Jesus begins at the moment that we declare that Jesus is Lord and Savior of our lives. And it's the Holy Spirit's work in us, transforming us into true disciples as we grow to listen and believe um, as we place our faith in Jesus Christ. So the principle here, ladies, is true disciples believe Jesus' word, words when he tells it to them. True disciples believe Jesus' words when he tells it to them. So Jesus' words are powerful. And we, um, I always say that we learn here at BSF in layers. So we learn more and more truths about who Jesus is. Each week we learn more truths and that allows us to build on the previous truths that we've learned about Jesus through his word. And that's what Jesus is allowing us to see with his disciples here in Matthew chapter 16. The progression of their growth through Jesus' teaching. So who is Jesus to you? Have you trusted in him as Lord and Savior of your life? Are you, are, are you delaying your trust in him because you're waiting for a miracle in your life? The biggest miracle already happened over 2,000 years ago when Jesus died and was resurrected and overcome. That's what he did. He overcame sin and death on your behalf. So how is Jesus calling you from confused faith to believe his words and calling you into a disciple of his kingdom. True discipleship means following Jesus at any cost. So are you willing to follow him at any cost? So in our next division, we'll look at the focus of Jesus' disciples. So in verse 21, Jesus began to reveal the full extent of his mission. For the first time, Jesus, we see him speak to his disciples about his death, that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things at the hands of the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and he must be killed, but on the third day he will be raised to life. So this was definitely not what his his disciples had expected. After fully understanding that he was the Messiah, the last thing that they expected was that he would suffer and be killed. But we see Jesus was very intentional as he prepared his disciples for his suffering and his death. So Jesus' death had always been part of God's sovereign plan. His death on the cross was a complete submission to his Father's will. But there was no holding Peter back. He was overwhelmed with emotion. And he was opposed to Jesus' words. Because look beginning in verse 22. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. Jesus knew what was really happening. So he told Peter, get behind me, Satan. You're a stumbling block to me. You do not have a mind that concerns, a mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. So the evil one was using Peter as his mouthpiece. So Jesus, he immediately recognized this. So he rebuked Satan. And Peter had just led the disciples to saying that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. And that he was stunned by the thoughts 
of Jesus' words. He could not believe it. And it was Peter's love for Jesus that led him to say this. But by rejecting Jesus' death, Peter was also rejecting God's eternal plan to save and redeem man, even if he didn't know it. And Peter didn't make a deliberate choice to reject God and embrace Satan. He simply let his mind focus on things of this earth instead of the eternal God. Things that, um, things of this present life instead of what was eternal. That's where his mind was going. So as a result, Satan grabbed the opportunity to influence Peter. So what about our minds? In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8, warns us to be alert and of so, sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Satan is the one who is always lurking to divert our focus away from Jesus. So after the initial shock and rebuke, Jesus went, he went on to explain what true disciples most focus on at this point. He wanted them to be able to see. So look what he said in verse 24. Whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So Jesus was saying that following him meant that the road ahead would be a difficult one for each of his disciples. Jesus' true disciples do not live for themselves. They follow him even when others reject them for the reason of following Jesus. So Jesus was demanding their, uh, their total commitment, their full commitment from his disciples, even to the extent of physical death. So he said in verse 25, For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses their life for me will find it. So Jesus is calling his disciples to fully surrender to him and to be part of the gospel message that they were going to proclaim to others. So how is God calling you to deny yourself this evening and to follow him? Jesus did not make his call to discipleship easy. He stressed the cost of being his follower. It requires our full obedience for his kingdom work. And then in verse 26, Jesus asked two questions. First, what good will it be for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? So Jesus is basically presenting to them their options to choose um, this dying world or to choose him, to choose eternal life with him. And Jesus knows that this decision is not an easy one. So he lays down an important truth in his second question. Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? So the fact is that we don't have the capacity to save ourselves from the judgment of our sins apart from Jesus. He's the one that saves us. So avoiding this journey of sharing his cross means that we may gain all that we want in this world, but actually lose everything in the end for all eternity. So then Jesus gave his disciples a glimpse of this in verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in his Father's glory with his angels, and then he will reward each person according to what they have done. So living for Jesus is not just about hardship. It's also about the joy that we are given and the hope that we are given for a future with Jesus because he promised there will be great rewards for those who follow him. So look again to verse 27. Jesus will come in glory with his angels and those who will follow him will reap the rewards of their choice.
But this was also a time of judgment for those who chose to take another path, the other one, the consequences of their choice. Those consequences will be final and they will be eternal, meaning they will be everlasting to everlasting. And after the command and the warning, look at the promise Jesus gave his disciples in verse 28. Truly I tell you, some who are standing here will not taste death before they see the Son of Man coming into his kingdom. So this promise is also recorded in Mark and Luke before the transfiguration. So again, we see Jesus preparing his disciples with a promise. He's preparing them for a glimpse of glory. So the principle here is... True disciples continually turn from everything else to follow him. True disciples continually turn from everything else to follow him. So what is Jesus asking you to turn from today in order to follow him with your whole heart? The world will continuously present us with many options. But as disciples of Jesus Christ, we put our faith and we put our focus in the person of Jesus Christ and we cling to Jesus' cross. And God is the one who calls us to follow Jesus at any cost because he's worth it. And we must see his glory and agree in our hearts that he is worthy of our trust and worthy of our obedience because true discipleship means following Jesus at any cost. So I go back to the question that we started with this evening. Who is Jesus to you? Will you pray with me, please? Most gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, we thank you that he went to the cross on our behalf. And Father, I lift up these ladies in prayer. I pray as they go to their groups that you will give them rich discussion, that it will be focused on you and that you will reveal to each one of us as we leave here this evening who you are to us personally. So I pray all these things in your precious son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen.